Welcome to the weekly update, where we'll go over the action in the market for the week of October 17th through the 21st, and then we'll see how things look for the week of October 24th through the 28th. And after three weeks of declines, we finally had an up week, and it was a pretty solid up week. Hasn't really changed an awful lot of things on our weekly charts. Some of the things that are extreme negative continue to be extreme negative. We're seeing some improvement on the daily charts. There's, of course, a case to be made that maybe we're setting a base and we're getting ready to go higher from here. But you could also make that exact same case that we're just kind of pausing for a little while before we're getting set to, set to go lower. So we'll have to see how things turn out from there. Let's go back and talk about the week session. The stock market had a strong week with the S&P up 4.7% on the week after three weeks of declines. Interest rates are having a real impact on stock prices. If interest rates are going up, stocks are going down and vice versa right now. Well, on Friday, we had a good solid up day and interest rates declined. Cash holdings are at their highest level since April of 2001 at 6.3%. That could be used as a contrary indicator meaning that folks are so confused right now. They've taken hits. They tried to put money to work and people don't get into the stock market to let their money sit in money markets. They, they want it to buy stocks. Well, they don't want to buy a stock and have it go down. And most people are long in the market, meaning buy low, sell high. So they're just keeping that money in cash in money market accounts right now. Well, if we start to look positive again, a lot of that money, if not all of it, could start coming into the stock market and that could help support prices in the S&P 500 and really help prices go higher. Also, we heard a lot of Fed speak over the last week. They're now in lockdown mode where they can't talk ahead of the meeting. So they had to make sure they got their two cents out there or two basis points out there before the, they couldn't talk anymore. First, we heard from Minneapolis Fed Kashkari, who will be a voter in 2023, said that he could see the Fed funds rate go above four and three quarters percent if core inflation doesn't improve. Now, this coming Friday, we have the PCE coming out, and one of those reports is the core inflation, the deflator. And that, in addition to the CPI report, are the two real gauges that we use to look at inflation. If that number it comes in hot or higher than expected, that could really do some damage to the market. If it comes in lower than expected, that could give some real solid support. We also heard from the Philadelphia Fed President, Harker, who's also a voter, said that he expects the Fed funds rate to be well above, whatever well above is, 4% by the end of the year. Hmm. Then when this, these comments were made, that the 10 year yield was just tanking in price and going way up with its yield to 4.23%. And the 10 year really rose this week. It went up a quarter of a percent just within a few days. Well, this didn't help things very much when they came out and said this. And this not only pushed interest rates up, well, it really helped stocks to decline. Then on Friday, we had the San Francisco Fed President Daly, who's not a voter, said that she thinks stepping down on the pace of rate increases will help preserve market structure. Blah. All that means is if we stop raising interest rates, the stock market will probably go up. Yeah, don't you think? Then the St. Louis Fed President Bullard, who we've heard from before, said that he hopes to get a deflationary process going in 2023. Well, isn't that why they're raising interest rates in the first place? When prices are going up, that's inflation. They want prices to not keep going up, which would be deflationary. Okay, so tell us something we don't know. But these are official folks now, so we have to listen to them. And one of the problems that has been plaguing the markets is that the employment situation still is really strong. And that's what the Fed is using to justify raising interest rates. The economy, we're seeing a lot of weakness there, but the employment situation is still holding up. And that's producing a lot of the back and forth tug of war. Then another thing that happened is on Friday, there was a Wall Street Journal article put out by, and I don't know how to say this name, Nick Timoreos. Forgive me if I said that wrong or 
thank me if I said that right, but this is a reporter that the Fed sometimes will go to just to kind of sneak a little information out there, like a trial balloon, where they just say, okay, let's feed this little bit to the Wall Street Journal, which most market participants read, and then see how the market reacts to that. So they leaked this information, and he indicated in this report that the Fed will raise rates another three quarters of a percent at their next meeting. That's what's expected, and that's what the market's been saying all along. The change comes in what might happen, <coughs> excuse me, at the December meeting. They're thinking that the market had been anticipating another three quarters of a percent increase. What if they just raise it half a percent instead of three quarters of a percent? And the market really liked that. And we had a really strong day on Friday. Earnings were typically generally better than expected. And sorry, I have to clear my throat again. <clears throat> Sorry about that. You got to love these take one videos. We had a number of well-known companies come out like Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, AT&T, Verizon, United Airlines, Lockheed Martin, IBM, Lamb Research. They all had really positive reports. Okay, so those companies are still holding up. But then we had Snap and Tesla. They got hammered pretty hard this past week. Their earnings reports were considered to be a disappointment. And then <laughs> Liz Truss resigned as the prime minister in the UK, who just took office like six weeks ago. And apparently things are just not working out over there. And so they're looking at appointing a new prime minister. And there's even talk that Boris Johnson, who was their former prime minister, might be back in the running for this whole thing. So, yeah. And then there's another gentleman. I don't remember his name right now. That was the favorite of a lot of folks in the UK, but he didn't win out. Maybe he'll win the prime ministership this time. But there's some real weird things going on in the UK right now. And it seemed to be like an every other day thing. We'd have something blow up in the UK. It would affect the EU and the US stock markets. Then they take a day off. And then another thing would happen. And then a day off. And then so... We'll have to see if this weekend ends up yielding anything different. So for the week, the S&P was up 4.74% on above average volume. Now, it was options expiration on Friday, so that helped to increase the volume count there. The technicals, you can make a case for either side. There's suggestions that we're building a base. We're coming into a favorable season for the market. There's some optimism that's starting to brew with the midterm elections coming up. There's this potential chance that the Fed might slow down their rate increases. So there's some things that could suggest we go higher. But our technicals are still pretty much negative overall. We have downtrends. We have a lot of headwinds that are facing the market. There's a lot of geopolitical events that are going on right now that could really have a negative impact on things. So it's it's really been a, a challenging environment to try to figure out what to do. The part that I have here in blue, Fed speak and policy, that just means they're locked down right now. And the part in gold, that's what the markets are most fixated on, realizing that any one of these other things that I have listed here, and even something that I don't have here, that could come to the forefront at any time and have an impact on the market. Our trend is still negative and getting stronger right now. It's going to take a lot more than just one up week after three down weeks to really turn our weekly charts. All right. And then I've been sharing this in the daily video updates. I thought I would include it here. It's just I'm doing this more from a humor standpoint that it says, do we have a World Series indicator? Could the Phillies win the World Series and tr trigger an economic downturn? History says yes, but logic says no. This is pure coincidence, but the last time the Phillies, the Philadelphia Phillies, won the World Series, 1929, 1930. Do you remember those were not really good years economically? We had the stock market crash in 29 and the depression at full swing in 1930. 1980, if you were growing up then, the economy was in real trouble at that point. And then, of course, 2008, that was during the great financial crisis. So... We'll have to see how things go. Now, at the time I record this, 
in the National League Championship Series. This is not the World Series. Philadelphia is leading San Diego two games to one. So whoever is the best out of seven, so whoever gets the four first will end up going to the World Series. This is not the World Series in and of itself. It's pure coincidence. I know there are people that want to connect everything. And you have one event on one side and an event on the other side. And magically, somehow they need to be related to each other. And that's where a lot of these conspiracy theories and crazy rationalizations come along to try to connect them, even if it doesn't make any sense at all. All right. Let's go back and look at the week. Oh, way over on the left, this is where we started out on Monday. We did gap higher, but then we kind of drifted sideways. We gapped higher on Tuesday, but then ended up having some more problems. On Wednesday, we were pretty much chopping sideways with not an awful lot happening. Thursday, we gapped higher and then ended up closing lower. And then on Friday, we didn't really gap, but we spent a lot of the day just going higher overall. So it was... A pretty good week. Didn't really change much from Tuesday to Friday, but we ended up on a positive note anyway. This is just showing how the different indexes perform during the week. And the Dow, that's the one on the left in green, that's holding up the best. And that's been, it's, we score these every day on a technical analysis basis. And it has the highest technical analysis score right now. The NASDAQ 100 also had a pretty good week, the S&P as well. Now, I'm only going back to five trading days in the week. I'm not going from Friday to Friday. So that's why these percentages may look a little bit different. But the mid caps way over on the right hand side, they didn't do as well, but they've been holding up a little bit better as we were going through a lot of the mess with the declines that we've been seeing recently. Then going back to the all time high set in the S&P 500, that's the pink one here. This just shows how these indexes have performed. It's the NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 that have gotten hit the hardest. So this is a lot of our growth areas. If we're going to turn around and start going higher, we want the NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 to start to perform better. So keep an eye on that if you're looking to go long in the market. As far as the sectors, the energy sector, which is now way back in the lead for doing the best, it was up. Tech had a pretty good week. Materials, all the sectors were up. At the bottom here, we had staples, which are things that you have to have no matter what's going on in the economy. They were still up, but lower than some of the other sectors. And utilities, which had been doing good and then were really doing bad, well, they showed a little bit of improvement in the past week. And this just shows over the last five trading days that energy was up the most, followed by materials, tech. And then way over here, we're seeing weakness in real estate. That was a sector for the five trading days. It was ended up being down on the week. Now, another thing, one of the reasons I'm posting this a little later than usual, I was waiting for the charts to update at currentmarketvaluation.com and they haven't updated. And I'm like, forget it. I need to record this and get it posted. So these charts that I'm going to show you, these are from a week ago. So if you use that as one of your sources, please go to their website and see if they update things and see if that helps you. But I don't have any updated charts to show you for this video. As far as sentiment, we're getting back more to the neutral area. We had spent a lot of time over in extreme fear as well as the fear camp. And a lot of times we use that as a contrary indicator. Well, since we've been going up, fear has been going away, which we're getting back to more of a neutral reading. And this shows the historical chart where we were down below 25 and then continuing to show some improvement with sentiment. Another sentiment indicator that we look at also showed a lot of improvement. These are the active asset money managers, the folks that buy and sell and look for the next latest and greatest stocks. Well, they were pretty extreme negative there for quite a while. And it's not like they've turned all over positive either, but they are showing some improvement. And when they get really extreme negative, we use this as a contrary indicator. Another thing that we look at is the Rydak bear bull ratio. This was updated as of Thursday. That's the latest reading that I had. And these folks, they're just getting whipsawed. It's like we have an update, so they get into the bear, the bullish fund. 
And then we have a down day. So then they jump into the bearish fund and they're, they're doing exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time because they're following what's already happened instead of trying to see what's happening before it happens, which is what I try to do. But one thing that we can take away from this is we really spiked up. We could go higher than this, but in the past week, we spiked up with the extreme fear. That means most folks were into the bearish mutual funds. And sometimes when it starts to come down, that can give some support to prices going higher. Also, individual investors, even though they improve slightly, they're still really pessimistic. We use this as a contrary indicator when it's giving us extreme readings. That could give some support to prices going up. But we've been camped down here for a while. We improve a little bit and then come right back down. We improve a little bit, come right back down. So be careful of that one to use it. The GDP now, the most recent one right here for the third quarter still has us at positive GDP at about 2.85. That's the reading that they're giving right now. This was coming down, 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 down. Didn't quite go negative, but it got close before it started to show some improvement recently. Another thing is the spread between risky bonds and not as risky bonds. That actually declined a little bit when we look at the spread between the two. When this really starts to go up, that means that there's trouble. Well, it declined over the past week. Also, this is the financial conditions index. We're getting really close to this black line here. As long as we stay below it, the conditions are looking okay. If we go above this, that's when things could start to get really bad. And you see, that's usually when we go into a recession. Well, we're not above that black line yet, but we want to keep an eye on this one too. Some Isabel net charts. This is just showing that a lot of people, for some reason now, are putting money into bonds. Well, the reason is interest rates are finally starting to go up and people are saying, wow, I can get a kind of a decent return. Look at the yield on that two years. It's higher than all the other maturities. And so they're starting to put bond money back to work. And that's why we're seeing a real spike right now of inflows into bonds. And that means they're buying bonds, which tends to push interest rates down. And if we get interest rates declining, that could also help the stock market to go higher. Looking at the insider transactions ratio, we actually went up here. We're not really bearish yet, but we had been down in the bullish side below this black line. Well, over the past week, since the last time we saw this chart, it has increased, which means there's some insider buying taking place. <clears throat> this is quantitative tightening to quantitative tinkering. This just shows the blues, the Fed, European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, Bank of England. Overall, the total, this just shows how they are tightening overall. Not if you didn't already know that already, because you can really see why the markets had a lot of headwinds in 2022. This is looking at the 12-month forward PE ratio for the world stocks. And that's one of the indexes that I show later on where they inverted this. This is the 10-year yield inverted. So as interest rates are going up, which remember they inverted it, so it's going down here, this is the PE ratio. So they do have a tendency to go in opposite directions, but then they invert it to make it go in the same direction. And this is not really all that positive. This is just showing that as interest rates are going up, the earnings look going forward are not looking as strong. And that makes sense. When interest rates go up, it, it costs money to borrow money and that bites into company profits and into their earnings. Another thing is the two-year yield. It's now 280 basis points higher than the dividend yield. So this light blue line, this is the dividend yield down here. And it's quite low where a lot of people are saying, well, forget that. I'm not going to get into the S&P 500 for the dividend. I'm going to jump into the two-year bond. It's giving me a lot higher, but two and a half percent, over two and a half percent, two and three quarters percent higher return right now than what you would be getting by just getting dividends from the S&P 500. Also, this is just a little map showing what the Fed has already done. Those are the dark blue areas. They're anticipating another 75 basis point move in November. Right now, they're kind of going with that 50 basis point move in December, but this is liable to change. So be wary of that one. And then by February, 2023, 
we'll be at the four and a half to four and three quarters rate. That's the projection. Here, this is negatively yielding debt. It's collapsed to 1.4 trillion. When we were really going up here, especially after the COVID plunge and when the market was doing a lot better, this was really having a tendency to go up. Well, it's come way down in 2022. Could that be a contrary indicator? Another thing, this just looks at all the different countries in the EU, Germany, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, and where their current rates are at. And you can see as one big kind of weird colored rainbow over here, they're all going up. Big surprise there. Then with FactSet, we had just an update of the earnings overall, and we've had 10 out of the 11 sectors, which have, they've got showing here. They still haven't put utilities into this area. And if it's red, that just means that it's below what they expected. If it's yellow, that was what they did expect. And if it's green, that means it was above expectations. And we can kind of see over the longer term how most of the companies have exceeded expectations. But remember, those expectations were also lowered. So be aware of those tricks. Okay, for the week, the VIX actually declined a little bit on a closing basis. And we're, we could be topping out with the VIX and starting to come down. That means fear is subsiding. The ulcer index still is quite high. I'm actually using this chart again on the daily videos. I think it's closer to what we're actually going through unless we see some more upside with the S&P. Then please tune into the daily videos if you wanna go through the possible positive scenarios. I have charts that I update every time I do a video each day. And those really are set to suggest that things could go higher. Well, when the market keeps going lower, those scenarios don't really seem all that viable. If we continue to see some improvement, that could suggest that some of these scenarios may play into action. And you might find that interesting for helping to make some decisions. As far as earnings, looking backwards at the Schiller PE ratio, we're at 27.66. The median and mean is between 16 and 17. So we're still on a historical basis, quite overvalued. But as I showed earlier in the week in a different video, we're about fairly valued when you're looking forward at the PE ratio. As far as FedWatch, we're, there's a 95% chance that at the November 2nd meeting, the Fed's gonna raise interest rates three quarters of a percent, which is gonna make the rate between three and three quarters and 4%. The Fed continues to let their balance sheet fall overall, even though it's going down kind of slow, it is declining nonetheless. Looking at breadth, it showed some improvement over the past week. We saw a really strong day on Friday, and that produced a really strong reading of upthrust in the weekly chart. But we have a long way to go if we're going to get back to these declining moving averages. The advanced decline ratio, after giving us an extreme negative reading down here with the blue line, it is showing some improvement. New highs, new lows. We're seeing a little more new lows than new highs on the weekly chart, but it is showing some improvement if we go back over a four period uh, moving average and 10 period is also still going higher. Accumulation distribution. We're still showing some improvement, but we're below a declining moving average. As far as our trend, the ADX is above 20 and it's advancing, even though the red line is declining. The red line is still on top, so this is a negative trend. Our Arun, after giving us an extreme negative reading, is showing some improvement. Mass index, not helping us right now. This is a daily chart showing how we came right back up to this pivot level, and this has acted as overhead resistance twice. This is at about 37, let's see if I can, 3763. So if we can get above that and then close above that, that would really help us get out of this sideways range that we've been in for a while. Also, we have this other support level down below us. If we decline and drop below that and go back down to this low, that could turn things a lot more negative. We're in about the midpoint of the trend channel. Currently, 
The pivot points were still below S1, but we have never been able to get down to S2. So that's at least that's holding up for right now. We're below the 50 period simple moving average and we are in a long-term downtrend. You're still gonna see the trend overall being down. The bullish percent index did show some improvement this past week after giving us an extreme negative reading and it's starting to bounce up above 30. The long-term chicken oscillator giving us an extreme negative reading and starting to bounce up out of that, that could be positive. The chicken money flow is showing a little bit of improvement, even though it's still negative. The force index is also showing some improvement, although it's still negative. The McClellan oscillator is positive. It's above zero and continuing to advance. The summation index based on price is starting to turn up and volume has already turned up and is looking a little bit better. So you can see there is justification for a base being built and that prices could go higher from here. But then you look at our oscillators and they're pretty much all still negative. But these take a longer amount of time to recalibrate. They're pretty much all positive on the daily charts, but here they're still overall negative. The Swinlin trading oscillator is looking more positive based on price and volume. We're above zero and advancing. The PMO, which on the daily chart is now positive, it's still negative on the weekly chart but we did get an extreme negative reading based on price and volume, and we're seeing some improvement. The PMOs that are rising, we're actually looking a little extreme right now. The buy signals are positive and advancing, and the PMOs that are above zero after giving an extreme negative reading are showing some improvement. The RSI is starting to turn back up, but it's still below 50. The special K is still above the moving average, but declining. The Stoke RSI, after giving an extreme negative reading, is showing improvement. Williams Percent R, also showing improvement after being extreme negative. The Vortex is still negative with the red line on top, but you see the red line is declining and the green line is advancing. Ultimate Oscillator, showing some improvement, but still below 50. Money Flow Indicator is turning up slightly, but still below 50. Nothing's on the percent B right now. We only get extreme readings when we start hitting these out either upper or lower Bollinger Bands. And that's not happening right now. The KST, after trying to cross over positive, is now crossing back over negative. And the PPO, after cr trying to cross positive, is still negative, but could be showing signs of improvement. The rate of change going back one week, well, we had a pretty strong up week. Not quite extreme, but if we had gone above this blue line, it may mean that we overdid it. Going back 50 periods, we were back down to the COVID low, and we're trying to turn up out of that. That could be positive. The copy curve not really helping us here, but we are still working off of a valid signal on the daily charts. Here's the weekly chart where we were able to stay above the 200-week moving average, and we were above, even though we dropped down last week, to this 50%, we were able to get back above that and then get back above the moving average. So far, that is positive. Looking at our different charts, the hike in Ashy is a little more positive with an open candle, where the Keggy is still negative, where it's drawing red, and the Renko is still negative, red. The ease of movement is showing a little bit of improvement, but still below zero. We had some new X's drawn into the point and figure chart a week ago. It looked like we were having a triple bottom breakdown. Well, when it generated these green X's, it wiped out that signal. Three line break is still looking negative overall. And then the elder impulse system is back to neutral for the S&P 500. The dots are on top, so that's negative with the SAR. Then here are, is the S&P, where we just show how we've been declining, where the mid caps have really been holding up a little bit better down here in the small caps, just setting a series of lower lows, which is very valid. But the S&P was dropping more than what we saw in the mid caps and even in the small caps. That's why we've been seeing the, those other indexes, the mid caps and small caps hold up better currently. Here's the all stocks, and this is compared to that forward-looking PE ratio chart that I showed earlier, 
where we're still in an overall downtrend, but things did improve over the past week. The mid caps are still in a downtrend, as are the small caps, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100, the Wilshire, everything's still pointing down. The NYSE, FANG stocks, ARC, software companies still in a downtrend. Here's Dow Theory showing how the Dow has been declining and showing some improvement. The transports kind of matching that where we saw a lot of really strong weakness coming into the utilities. And right now I'm seeing this not only here, but on the daily chart as more of a negative divergence. And on the daily chart, we saw on Friday's bounce, the Dow really outpaced transports. That could be a really short-term negative divergence. CRB index, getting really close. It's already crossed over negative on the daily chart. The red line is really coming down and could give us a death cross here on the weekly chart. But until then, we remain in an overall uptrend, but showing a lot of weakness. Copper, just kind of going sideways right now, where gold, which should be at the moon already, in fact, it's going the other way, is still in an overall downtrend, as is silver. Oil closed at around 85, 85.05 to be exact, and has been in an overall downtrend. They're really trying hard in Washington, D.C. to push these prices down because this is what folks really see. And this is why they're tapping more into the strategic oil reserve, which is supposed to be for emergencies only. And an election is not an emergency. But if they can flood the U.S. market, even though they're selling a lot of this overseas, that could help drive gas prices down. And that's most in your face. And the people in Washington, D.C. that want to get reelected, they're like, look, see, gas prices are going down. Reelect me. Where the other side is going, well, gas prices are not going down all that much. We've got really bad inflation. Vote for me. So it's just a political ploy that happens. But that's putting us at risk because it, we're not supposed to tap into that reserve. That's supposed to be if we get into some kind of military action and we need that for our military What's going to happen if something does happen before that reserve gets replenished? That's really going to, could come back to bite us. Let's just really hope something like that doesn't happen. Here's the weekly chart of the dollar. Even though it did show some weakness over the last week, it is still in just this monster uptrend overall. Looking at bonds where we saw a little bit of a bounce, but we're still in an overall downtrend with the bond prices. The 10-year treasury yield after really spiking up at over four and a quarter is now down at 4.213%. So you can see how we're seeing a breakout of the 10-year yield. Then this is another chart. This is where we have the VIX that measures stocks. Well, this is the move index that measures volatility and bond prices. And we just see here how as interest rates have been going up, Bond prices have been going down. And so that's why this move index has really been going higher. And then here just shows overall, this is the increase in interest rates. But in Friday's session, this is a daily chart, shows how things actually came back down a little bit. And we have some lines crossing each other here. You've got the two year in the lead and it's just pretty crazy currently. Here's a weekly chart showing with all the problems going on in the UK, they shot up and their interest rate is a little bit higher now than what people are paying in the US. That's the green line in here. Germany is also seeing an increase in interest rates where Japan is still trying to keep everything flat because they have their own economic potential time bomb developing there. And they're still trying to stimulate their economy where you have the US, the UK and Germany meaning the EU, they're trying to keep inflation under control. That would be like a luxury item in Japan right now. All right, so let's look at intermarket analysis. Going back to the beginning of the year, oil has been doing the best, followed by the dollar, where you've had gold, stocks, and bonds are down since the beginning of the year. Looking at some shorter maturities, we're seeing that the shorter maturities were underperforming stocks, even though... The, the blue line is still slightly above the red line. If this continues to fall, that could produce a death cross. Looking at a monthly chart just shows how stocks have really outperforming bonds. 
And it's not that stocks have been doing great. It's that bonds have been doing so terrible. That's why you see this really spiking up. Gold, which is still really suffering. The dollar, which is going up. That's why you're seeing this really decrease. And gold to the S&P 500, it really decreased because the S&P was up and gold was down. The low volatility stocks, which tend to be safer and more difficult environments, still in an overall uptrend, but did see some weakness. Growth versus value, still in an overall downtrend, even though it ticked up slightly. The NASDAQ 100 against the rest of the S&P in a downtrend, but showed a little improvement. S&P 100 ticked up a little bit when compared to the S&P 500, but still in a downtrend. Discretionary, the thing that makes life fun, that's underperforming the things that you have to have, like toilet paper and toothpaste. And then energy, which has been doing really well. Tech, which has really been suffering, just shows that energy has been outperforming the tech sector. So what's our outlook then? On Monday, we're getting the IHS market manufacturing and services PMI. Not really big reports, not real influential in and of themselves. On Tuesday, we're getting the housing price index. We'll get the Case-Shiller home price index as well. Some more housing data is coming out. Consumer confidence, that can have an impact. On Wednesday, every week, we get the mortgage applications index. New home sales, that'll be some more housing information. Thursday, this is kind of the biggie. This will be the first advance report of GDP to see how are things looking for the third quarter. Durable goods will also be coming out. And then every week we get jobless claims. Friday, this will probably be really big too. We get personal income and spending with the PCE prices. And that's when the deflator comes out, which gives us an interest rate or an inflation rate, excuse me. And the employment cost index, how much is it costing companies to employ people? That can often have some influence as well. And then we get the final reading of the consumer sentiment, which came out a week ago. So the technicals, yeah, you can see on the weekly charts, they're still pretty overall negative. We're showing some extreme negative readings with some improvement. You might want to follow some of the daily charts for a while now just to see how things improve overall. But we could make a case for either side right now, as I've been stating. Inflation and interest rates are the real fixation. The Fed is not speaking right now because they're getting ready to meet. We have our whole list of geopolitical concerns that could influence the market at any time. So our scenarios, and this is based on the daily chart from Monday's session, we could say that we're going to go down from here because of all these headwinds. And But you don't really want to go short because the technicals are turning positive. But they're only going to keep turning positive if, if we see more buying. So what about going with the up scenario? Well, you could make a you know, strong case for that. They're turning positive, but we're still negative overall. And we're not going to see more improvement if there's not more buying. Sometimes the Monday after options expiration can be a negative day. And we had an up day on Friday that might suggest that there could be some weakness on Monday. Doesn't mean that's automatically what's going to happen. It's just sometimes that is what happens. Our scenarios, again, tune into the daily videos to watch those if those are of interest to you. The technicals, they're improving a lot, especially on the daily charts. In the short term, we're actually looking a little overextended, even a little overbought because of that strong update that we saw on Friday. But we're seeing a little bit of improvement there with the positive scenario, but there's still an awful lot of negative as well. And then sideways, both on the daily chart and the weekly chart, the ADX is still above 20. So it's really hard to justify that we're going sideways right now. So thank you. Have a wonderful week. Please feel free to check out some of the daily videos. And I will also be posting the intermarket analysis video.